Hello and welcome! This is our CES 2025 coverage video of the new CPU and GPU releases for laptops. Josh is on the ground at CES, so I'll be helping out on this one. As always, we want to help you sift through the stupid and confusing names. That way you can figure out what you actually need to know and which ones you should consider buying. First, we're going to talk about CPUs. We've created a bird's eye view to try and help you better understand where each of these CPUs is likely to stack up regarding performance. We've referenced provided materials from the manufacturers, as well as benchmark leaks and our own knowledge, to try and simplify the confusing mess that is this year's releases as much as possible. We will begin with the higher-powered CPU announcements. Starting with AMD's newest FireRange HX3D processor that is set to be released in the first half of 2025. It will be released in laptops like Asus's Strix G16, which is a less premium little brother to Taylor's favorite, the Strix Scar. From the specs we are seeing here, these are going to slot in nicely right above the Zen 5 Strix point release from midway through last year. All three of the announced FireRange SKUs have a base TDP of 54 watts, but these numbers are pretty meaningless. Manufacturers often feed these laptops higher power for more performance. It really comes down to what the laptop can effectively cool without sounding like a fighter jet, as higher power draw means more heat output. Anyway, the highest-end Ryzen 9 9955HX3D has 16 cores and 32 threads, a whopping 144 megabytes of 3D vCache designed for gaming, and it reaches a max boost of 5.4 gigahertz. AMD claims this is the world's best gaming and content creation mobile processor, which would surely be interesting if it proved to be true in our testing. If you're wondering why they followed their desktop naming conventions instead of incrementing in the 300s, that is because this is meant to be a pared-down version of their newest desktop processor. Next. AMD has also announced their Strix Halo APUs, with both Zen 5 performance cores and significantly more RDNA 3.5 graphics cores, aka compute units, than their standard CPUs. These are near the top of our list for most compelling processors set to be released in the first half of the year. They also follow the most ridiculous naming convention we've maybe ever heard? Their highest-end chip is titled the Ryzen AI Max Plus Pro 395. And yes, PRO is in all caps for some reason. When looking at their specs, the graphics on the Plus version seem to be better, and it has more cores. I was also trying to determine what made it the Pro version so I could explain it to all you lovely people, but I came up empty. They have a Pro and non-Pro variant of each of these SKUs, but their provided numbers are exactly the same. The only difference I could find is that the Max Pros offer a 6-core variant that the Max Only section does not. There will probably be more information coming soon, so get subscribed to stay hot on the trail of this mystery. Anyways, gang. All of these are going to have a TDP range of 45 to 120 watts, powering their up to 16 performance cores, and can include from 16 up to 40 graphics cores. These SKUs also feature up to 80 megabytes of cache and up to 5.1 gigahertz max frequency boost. They have 256 gigabytes a second memory access, with these graphics cores having access to 75% of system memory. We think this could offer a lot of value in the data science space, where the GPU having access to lots of memory is critical. We also know from Geekbench leaks that these are set to perform about as well as the M4 Pro 12 core from Apple for CPU tasks. If true, that is a very strong result. However, we'd need to do our own testing to confirm this. If you prefer Team Blue for your high-powered gaming or productivity laptops, Intel's most powerful chips are going to be their newest Arrow Lake HX processors. These will be replacing the current Raptor Lake, or 14th gen chips, included in laptops like Asus's Strix Scar 18, which is their beefiest gaming machine in a technically portable package. They have announced six different SKUs that really boil down to three variants with different clock speeds. All of them have a TDP range of 55 to 160 watts. Their highest-end 285HX processor will feature 24 cores, 8 performance and 16 efficient, 24 threads, 36 megabytes of cache, and up to 5.5 gigahertz max frequency. This one's specs still list it with a lower thread count than the i9-14900HX from Raptor Lake, but that doesn't mean it won't perform the same or better. Arrow Lake is likely to be far more efficient and therefore do more with less. This architecture is essentially an improvement on Core Ultra Meteor Lake that we saw introduced last year for mid-range performance laptops like the Thin and Light Zephyrus G16. It offered better efficiency for similar performance to the Raptor Lake H processors that it was replacing. So, Raptor Lake 14th Gen to Arrow Lake HX, we expect a big improvement in efficiency. What we don't expect, however, is for it to significantly outperform the newest AMD chips, like Intel's press slides would have you believe. In one of their graphs, they fed the 285HX chip 150 watts and claim a huge boost over the AMD Ryzen 9 HX375 chip, as well as the Qualcomm 84100 chip, but both of those are being fed significantly less wattage, so it's a very misleading comparison. When you look at the lower wattage example of the 285HX on the graph, the numbers are much closer and could be eclipsed by AMD's fire range. Below their HX processors, Intel also announced their Arrow Lake H range at CES this year. 
This range is replacing late 2023's Meteor Lake release and will be featured in more standard consumer laptops, like the VivaBook S16, as well as thinner gaming PCs just like the Zephyrus G16 I just mentioned. All of them have a configurable 28 to 115 watt TDP range. The highest SKU, the Core Ultra 9 285H processor, has 16 cores, 6 performance, 8 efficient, and 2 low powered efficient cores, just like Meteor Lake. It is single threaded with 24 megabytes of cache and up to 5.4 gigahertz max frequency. Unlike the HX chips, the H chips will have better integrated graphics via Intel's Arc technology. This is the same powerful integrated graphics you may have heard about on their Lunar Lake V processors for small and light laptops. This inclusion leads to the 285H chip doing 22% better than its prior generation 185H chip in 1080p gaming, running on the integrated GPU. In fact, according to Intel, the new 285H actually pulls less power while doing this, 45 watts versus 55 watts. These are their numbers, not ours, so we'll have to verify it, of course. The Arrow Lake H processor also beat Qualcomm's Snapdragon X Elite 84100 chip in game performance by a whopping 58%, according to their provided numbers. This isn't surprising, as we found Qualcomm's integrated GPUs to be lackluster. Heck, those laptops can't even run some games due to their ARM architecture. But on the flip side, the 285H still only does about as well as AMD's Zen 5 365 chip. We found this to be a little disappointing. As a whole, with these Arrow Lake H CPUs, we hope they can make Intel competitive with AMD. In 2024, there really was no reason to buy Intel's Core Ultra 9 Meteor Lake processor over AMD's Zen 5 Strix Point. In our testing, we found AMD was just more efficient, offering more performance per watt at every power draw. Rounding out Intel's Arrow Lake H and HX, just a heads up that only Thunderbolt 4 is actually built into the chipset. Thunderbolt 5 will be present if the manufacturer chooses to include it, so don't expect every new Intel laptop to have it. Overall, Intel's announcement seemed like a mostly incremental upgrade from their current gen of more powerful processors, but it is nice to see Meteor Lake and Raptor Lake being replaced by one unified Arrow Lake branding. Now, while those looking for a high-performance laptop got a lot of great announcements this year, we also saw some solid ones for those looking for an everyday laptop with more basic performance needs. The following CPUs are geared towards people just looking for a laptop for basic home or office use, students, or even those shopping on a tighter budget. From AMD, we saw two distinct sets of CPUs to be aware of for our light users out there. The first is Kraken Point, which are the Ryzen 5 and 7 chips on the newest Zen 5 architecture set to be released in the first quarter of 2025. These will be lower core count chips that can be offered in less powerful laptops like the ZenBook 14. You can get either the Ryzen AI 7350 or Ryzen AI 5340. They both have a TDP range of 15 to 54 watts. The Ryzen 7 chip will have eight cores, a 24 megabyte cache, and Radeon 860M graphics. The Ryzen 5 will have six cores, a 22 megabyte cache, and 840M graphics. There was also a pro version announced of both of these chips, but just like the Strix Halo ones, I literally cannot determine the difference between them. I'm hopeful that there is one though, so people aren't just paying more for nothing. The second release from AMD for lower powered laptops is their re-release of Zen 4 Hawkpoint, now named Ryzen 200. There are seven SKUs being released in the second quarter of 2025 that go from Ryzen 3 to Ryzen 9, offering a variety of options in the space. We expect to see these in more budget-friendly laptops, but we are also seeing them in some smaller gaming laptops like the Zephyrus G14, which will continue to use its Hawkpoint technology. However, AMD is not the only one who is refreshing their older architecture under new branding this year. Intel is also putting out their Core Ultra 200 U-Series, which is a refinement of their older U-Series chips with their Meteor Lake architecture. These processors are designed for low-power, cheaper laptops and do not have the more powerful integrated GPU that Meteor Lake first introduced and Lunar Lake further improved on. Anyway, these 200U processors will have the same TDP range of 15 to 57 watts, same core count with two performance, eight efficient, and two low-powered efficient cores, same number of threads at 14, and same cache size at 12 megabytes. The improvements I mentioned are that these new 200U chips have a higher max gigahertz of 5.3 up from 4.3 and higher max memory speeds. Look, we have concerns here. Will the average consumer who buys a laptop for light use understand the difference when they see two different Core Ultra laptops being sold, one with Lunar Lake V and one with this improved Meteor Lake U processor? Yes, Lunar Lake processors will be in more premium devices like those with aluminum or metal chassis, but will one of these buyers really care, or will they just buy the one that is cheaper but also has a Core Ultra processor? If you think this is the end of the confusion, you'd be wrong. On top of refreshing Meteor Lake for a rebrand, Intel is also renaming and slightly improving their older Raptor Lake architecture as Core Chips, without the Ultra name. They will have a range of SKUs available all the way up to Core 9 200H chips, which will mirror their 13th Gen H chips. These will be seen in much more budget laptops, even below the 200U chips, and their performance will likely reflect that, even though the chips have received some tuning with the rename. Look, what it looks like Intel is doing is coming out with a good, better, best option for each type of buyer all under the same Core 200 branding. For light users, the Core U, the Core Ultra U, and Core Ultra V. And for those wanting a balance of portability and performance, the Core H and Core Ultra H series. 
However, we feel that there are way too many options, and prices of laptops with these processors will heavily overlap, which will just lead to mass confusion. We are worried that buyers will overspend on something that they don't need, or buy a laptop without enough performance for what they do need. Look, at least it keeps us in business to explain this all to you. So thank you to both AMD and Intel for that. Now, saving the least exciting announcement for last, we have Qualcomm bringing up the rear with their release of the Snapdragon X processor. This is a base version of the previously released X Plus and X Elite processors built on the same architecture. Following the same naming convention, this one is X1 26100 to indicate it is the lowest end in their lineup. Its main downgrade from the already very low performing unimpressive X plus 42100 chip is that it only goes up to three gigahertz and doesn't have any boost frequency. So we expect this chip's performance to be extremely basic. Think cheap Chromebook levels. We get the strategy here. Offer something for those on a really tight budget. But the reality is those buyers can buy a much better laptop from a prior year now on a big sale. They could also buy a refurbished laptop or even a secondhand one. Both would give you more laptop for the same money. Buying a new current gen laptop just isn't the only option. And even so, as I just told you, Intel and AMD are now offering very cheap options too. But on the plus side, we applaud Qualcomm for keeping their CPU naming simple at least. But then again, they haven't been around for long enough in the laptop CPU market to become confusing. Look, as much as we aren't the biggest fans of the Snapdragon X announcement, we are hopeful that these Windows on ARM chips can continue to carve themselves a space in the laptop market, as more competition is always good. Now, let's get into the exciting new NVIDIA RTX 50 series coming to laptops in March 2025. NVIDIA has announced only part of their standard range of dedicated mobile GPUs, the 5070 through 5090. However, this year they are bringing us one more mobile graphics card to bridge the gap between the 5070 and the 5080, the 5070 Ti. Last year, the 4070 was only marginally better than the 4060, but there was a big performance increase and price increase to the 4080, so we like the introduction of a 5070 Ti. The motherboards that will be used by manufacturers will have two variants, one that support the 5070 and yet to be announced 5060 and 5050, which we all know are coming next, and then one for 5070 Ti and above. This means it's likely that we'll see some models offering only the lower or higher range of cards. One of the biggest announcements with the 50 series cards is that they will now have access to DLSS 4, which enables multi-frame generation, a method of generating up to three additional frames per traditionally rendered frame. Something to keep in mind though, is that this isn't available in most games yet, and you're still only getting the responsiveness of actual rendered frames. Even if your FPS number is much higher, you're going to be experiencing the same latency. On the other hand, one more benefit of DLSS 4 is that it improves single frame generation for both the 40 and 50 series cards, supposedly reducing VRAM usage. This is a big win if true. Clearly we'll have to independently test this to find out if this is truly free frames or if there is a cost to it. As far as specs go, the 5090 will come with a TDP range of 95 to 150 watts, but we've heard from manufacturers that they feed these GPUs up to 175 watts. We think the Delta is the boost. They also have 24 gigs of GDDR7 memory and over 10,000 CUDA cores. They're also claiming 1,824 tops, which is almost triple what the 4090 was capable of. The memory bus or interface width of all the cards appears mostly the same from last generation, except the 5080 did get a boost up to 256 bit this time around. We're also happy to see that memory bandwidth has increased. These numbers weren't on their website, so we had to request them from Nvidia directly. So far, the main differences between the 40 series and 50 series seem to be a significant increase in memory and AI tops. However, just because there is such a big increase in tops doesn't mean the standard rasterization games rely on will see anywhere near this increase. For example, we are only seeing an 8% increase in CUDA cores from the 4090 to the 5090. In fact, because they didn't mention rasterization, it has us a little worried. When showing their desktop benchmarks, Nvidia showed less of an improvement in the games that didn't support DLSS 4's multi-frame generation or have DLSS at all. This aligns to our concerns that there won't actually be a significant improvement of truly rendered frames when upgrading to the 50 series. Check out Jay's Two Cents video for some great analysis on this. They estimate about a 25% increase rather than the double Nvidia was highlighting. When it comes to memory, we weren't happy that the lowest mobile card announced, the 5070, is still coming with eight gigs of memory at 128 bit. That means that I'd expect to see the later release of the 5060 or 5050 to have the same eight and six gigs of memory respectively as the prior generation. The reason we are disappointed is that we do expect these GPUs to perform better and be more capable of handling higher resolution gaming. Higher resolution rendering requires more graphics memory. When comparing these to the desktop 50 series cards, the desktop GPUs have more memory, 32 gigs on the 5090 instead of 24, for example. As a whole, this NVIDIA release seems to be the most geared towards AI and machine learning, which is not a shock when you look at how often that theme came up at CES this year. Hopefully for data scientists, this should make model training more viable on laptop GPUs. Well, that was a lot. 
We can't wait to get all these new laptops in the coming months to see how these processors actually perform. On that note, get subscribed with the notification bell on as we will absolutely be testing them all like crazy when they come into the studio. If you're chomping at the bit to buy a laptop with a new processor or GPU, we have added a new list on our website where we'll place all the ones that are available for sale the moment they are listed. After two months or so, we'll drop that list and just update our regular ones, but hopefully that should help you find the new ones. Till next time, go do something awesome with your day and we will catch you later.